really focusing on hitting up the taxpayer for more revenue. Well, that's right. They're talking about revenue, but the tax increases that they're recommending are more distracting <coughs> than illuminating. I think it is fair to say that all of the talk by the president and his congressional allies about corporate jets and yachts is a classic red herring. Where is that? <laughs> well, on this chart, it just the name of this fallacy comes from the sport of fox hunting in which a dried smoked herring, which is red in color, is dragged across the trail of the fox to show the hounds off the scent. Thus, a red herring argument <clears throat> is one which distracts the audience from the issue in question though the, uh, through the introduction of some irrelevancy. <clears throat> well, we use this all the time, uh, but I'm afraid it's worth discussing uh, how politicians use it. Well, as you can see, that's what they're doing. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you bring this up. I did some research and found that the term red herring comes from the sport of fox hunting, as we mentioned here. And the red herring is one which distracts the audience from the issue in question through the introduction of some irrelevancy. And in my view, all of these tax issues that President Obama and those on the other side of the aisle are discussing are red herrings, meant to distract Americans from the real driver of our deficits <coughs> and debt, and the real choices that Democrats have, uh, have to but are refusing to make. Let me walk through some examples. If we were to raise the depreciable life on corporate jets from five years to seven years, as the Democrats propose, it would yield $3.1 billion over 10 years. And how many, uh, I'll just say. Oh, well, uh, how many days of debt reduction uh, over that 10-year period <coughs> would a $3 billion savings or increase in taxes uh, amount to, Senator Hatch? Well, you know, to hear the President talk, you would think that this is the key <clears throat> to balancing our budget. We all know that he's overstating the case, but it would provide at least a month of debt reduction. I think that's about all it would, would do. Now, given its essential role in his deficit reduction proposals, you would hope so, but I'm sorry to disappoint my friend from Alabama. According to our calculations, that amount equates to only 24 hours and 23 minutes of the debt over the next 10 years. So unfortunately, that doesn't even, solve, that doesn't even, be, even begin to solve the problem. And uh, of course, as you can see here, uh, $13 trillion, the Obama debt, uh, uh, there'd be $3,100,000 uh, $3, over time for corporate jet taxes. And the remaining Obama debt, assuming that they didn't spend more, which is an assumption you can't make, would be $12,996,900,000,000 remaining Obama debt. Is the problem solved? Of course not. Well, uh, let me just say I appreciate the work of the ranking uh, member of the Finance Committee and longtime member of that committee. So it seems to me pretty clearly that under the President's budget that he submitted earlier this year, which I have to say was voted down 97 to nothing in the United States Senate, his budget would have increased the deficit over 10 years by 13,000 billion, and he suggested that his plan to reduce, uh, increase taxes on corporate jets by 3 billion would somehow make a difference in that. And I think, Senator Hatch, you're right uh, that that's not accurate. Um, how about other proposals we hear from the Democrats, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Senator Hatch, cutting back mortgage interest deduction for yachts as used for second homes? Well, in other words, uh, by our calculations, the savings from this proposal would be even more meager. If Congress enacted this change, we could cover the debt from the Obama bu budget for all of 15 hours and 47 minutes. Again, this does not solve the problem, problems of the burdensome debt the President is piling on. Well, it is shocking to see how small those numbers are, and we aren't really hearing that in the press and the national discussions. For the talk we've heard about these proposals, you'd think they'd yield more than two days of debt uh, reduction over 10 years. Well, you would think so. But the other 3,651 days of debt under the 10-year Obama budget would not even be touched. There's a third red herring that has been thrown out there. Maybe that one closes the gap. 
We've all heard the president talk about hitting American oil companies by reducing or eliminating domestic energy incentives. Now, this is a real priority of his and of congressional Democrats. We had a cloture vote on a bill by our friend from New Jersey to extract $21 billion in revenue from U.S. oil companies. The Finance Committee had a hearing where the other side touted the benefits of this tax increase by grilling the CEOs of the top five oil companies. If you listen to my friends on the other side, one would think that an additional $21 billion would solve all our fiscal problems. Their rhetoric suggests that this is the only thing standing between more money to send kids to college and provide school lunches. But I wonder if my friend from Alabama might put into perspective how much of the 10 years of debt in the president's budget this proposal would cover. Well, with 13 billion, or 13 trillion, that's 13,000 billion, uh, 21 billion won't amount to much. Well, here's how many days of the 10-year debt of the Obama uh, budget would be covered. Keep, keep in mind that this proposal originated from our friend from New Jersey, the head of the Senate Democratic campaign operation, and his tag teammate, the head of the Senate Democratic message operation, the so-called War Room, the senior senator from New York. I will let others decide whether this proposal was more political than substantive, but people should at least know the facts about this proposal before deciding. And as a deficit reduction proposal, this is very weak tea. This is a much ballyhooed proposal, and it would cover the deficit for uh, actuality five days, 18 hours, and 47 minutes. Here's the, here's the oil rig proposal. We got a $13 trillion debt. Actually, it's about $13.5 trillion debt right now. You would save $21 billion on the oil and gas extra taxes. And even at that, we'd have a remaining debt of $12,978,900,000,000. Is the problem solved? Of course not. Well, Senator Hatch, you've um, uh, served on the Finance Committee for a number of years, and now the senior Republican, ranking Republican there. If you listen to our friends on the other side of the aisle, it would appear that all fiscal problems could be resolved by taxing millionaires. Uh, is that something you're familiar with, that argument? Well, I sure am. Anybody, anyone, anybody watching C-SPAN will see our friends on the other side making the argument day in and day out. When I hear this argument, I often think of a saying from a distinguished former chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, Senator Russell Long. When talking about tax reform, Senator Long said, some might reduce the politics to this. Don't tax you. Don't tax me. Tax that fellow behind the tree. <laughs> and since there are a lot more folks who aren't millionaires than are, the Democrats have calculated that the politics of class warfare works. All of our problems could be solved if the rich just paid their fair share, according to the Democrats. As politics, this might sound, uh, might sound, I don't even think it sounds good, but, but as tax policy and as a proposal to reduce our deficits and debt, this is a fourth red herring. It does not come close to fixing the deficits from the Obama budget. Our friends on the other side frequently cite the Tax Policy Center, or TPC, for tax data. Now that makes some sense. TPC is a professional think tank that is a joint venture of two center-left think tanks, the Urban Institute and the Brookings Institution. With the exception of its director, Donald Moran, TPC is largely staffed by highly qualified tax professionals who worked in Democratic Treasury Departments and Democratic Hill offices. TPC is a solid professional outfit, but you can't ignore its institutional perspective. To be fair, I'd say the same thing about the Heritage Foundation. Their institutional perspective is more likely to line up with folks on my side of the aisle. Nonetheless, I'm drawing from TPC data some of the assumptions which I might not agree with. According to TPC models and estimates for 2011, American households earning more than $1 million account for 12% of the nation's pre-tax income, they pay 19% of federal taxes and carry an average tax rate of 29%. Now, even more critical from my perspective, these taxpayers also account for 38% of all follow or flow-through income. Flow-through income is predominantly earnings from the ownership of small businesses, so raising rates on the rich will squarely hit those 
who create and expand the small businesses that need to be the engine of our economic recovery. But let's be clear about something. Higher taxes on these wealthy individuals will not only have adverse economic consequences, it will not even provide the deficit and debt reduction suggested by the left. Even if all the income, every dime that they earn of those earning more than $1 million were confiscated with a 100% rate, with the unlikely assumption of no taxpayer behavioral response, for the year of confiscation, these higher taxes would yield about $893 billion. Now, that would be a one-time confiscation. Surely none of these folks would continue to work, save, or invest in the future if the government were going to confiscate all their income. They'd have to cover all of their other expenses, including state and local taxes, from savings. And after taking everything from the folks behind the tree, in this case, the folks earning more than $1 million, how many days of the 10-year Obama budget debt would be eliminated? Well, not many, I answer to that. But as often as the president talks about taxing the rich or spreading the wealth around as a cure for our fiscal problems, you would think it would balance the budget. But would it get us there? Well, I say to my friend from Alabama, confiscating all the income from those earning over $1 million does not even fix one year of the 10 years of projected Obama debt. It would cover 244 days, 16 hours, and 34 minutes. That's it. Not even one year. And federal policy, just look at this, and federal policy uh, makers could kiss that revenue source goodbye after an event like confiscation. So there you are, $13 trillion. Take the 893. If we took every dime that millionaires made this next year, the $893 billion, we'd be down to $12,107 uh, uh, billion dollars remaining debt. Is the problem solved? Of course not. Well, going back to the other chart on taxation and spending under the Obama budget, uh, I would note that the President Obama's budget uh, raised taxes significantly, increased spending even more, and as a result, over 10 years, created more debt projected than if he'd made no budget at all. Right. And in, and that's, which is a stunning thing. But you can talk about raising taxes on the American workers, on families, on small businesses, on the wealthy and investors all you want. But this talk is easy. It ignores the root causes of the deficit and debt problem here in Washington. Uh, out of control spending. It may sound uh, cliche uh, to the American people that Republicans are always talking about out of control spending. Uh, we wish it were a joke. Yeah, I it's wish too it was. sadly true. I wish it was, too. I'm surprised about this debate. The press is not pushing Democrats on what a joke their proposals about jets and yachts are. But the American people, the people I represent in Utah, understand that these are red herrings. These proposals deal with the president's legacy of debt for less than two days, less than two days over the next 10 years. Add in the much publicized tax hit on the hated oil companies, you get another five days. So after all the demagoguery on jets and yachts and oil companies, you get about one week of deficit reduction. And even throwing in a one-time confiscation of all the income for taxpayers above $1 million, you can only add 244 days. Add it all up, and there is still less than one year. All those tax increases don't even get to one-tenth of the debt President Obama will add over the next 10 years. It's just class warfare, we all know that. All the talk from the White House and from our friends on the other side is on behalf of proposals that would address, at best, less than 10% of the debt forced on American families by the President's budget. I asked my friend from Alabama if he might conclude with the classic definition of a red herring. Well, let's take another look at the definition of red herring on your chart. It says, the name of this fallacy comes from the sport of fox hunting in which a dried smoked herring, which is red in color, is dragged across the trail of the fox uh, to throw the hounds off the scent. Thus, a red herring argument is one which distracts the audience from the issue in question through the introduction of some irrelevancy. Our friends on the other side, using White House talking points, sophisticatedly prepared, appear to have resorted to red herrings 
with their deficit reduction proposals. They want the American people to think that a few easy tax increases on the rich or yacht owners or corporate jet users or oil companies, the people behind the tree, uh, can solve our debt crisis without spending reforms. They hope that these red herrings will hide a serious democratic vulnerability if they are not going to address spending in a serious way. Massive tax increases on the middle class will be a necessity. These red herrings are designed to throw those citizens who care deeply about reducing the $13 trillion debt uh, that President's budget will incur off the trail. The trail of deficit reduction leads to one of two places, restraining out-of-control spending or crushing tax relief or increases on middle-class families. Restraining spending is not a red herring. It cuts to the heart of our fiscal problems. It goes to the root of the problem. The president and his allies need to come clean with the American people. The president so far has refused to present a deficit reduction plan. Uh, and these negotiations go on. He says he has one, but we never see it. So it can be scored and analyzed. The White House seems content to produce cheap talking points justifying these red herrings rather than meaningfully ad addressing our debt crisis. As I've said before and will again, this shows a disrespect, I think, for the American people. Our people deserve better. They need honest, fair ana analyses of the problems we face. I expect that they will reward those, however, who talk straight with them and offer serious grown-up efforts to address our debt uh, with their support. And I think they'll be unhappy uh, if we, re once it's realized how little these proposals would impact the huge debt crisis we're now facing. Well, I thank my colleague for his kind remarks. I have to say that, uh, that not only would it not impact, but it would impact a lot of jobs. I remember when we did the yacht, so-called yacht tax back in the early 90s, uh, the left just thought that was a wonderful thing. We'd get after all these rich yacht owners. And when they found out that thousands and thousands of jobs were lost because of that bill, they immediately turned tail and, uh, and got rid of the bill pretty doggone quickly afterwards. And what we haven't said is we're assuming that $13 trillion is going to stay the same. Actually, in the next 10 years, there's a good chance it'll double to, to over $20 trillion and possibly as high as uh, 25 or $26 trillion the way this administration is spending. And frankly, if we get there, we're going to have a re very difficult time ever coming out of this hole that we're in right now. And all I can say is that, you know, I like the president personally, but, you know, he hasn't presented a program. He's calling Congress to do it all, and, and we have our various problems here in getting together but he hasn't let out on these programs, and neither have the other people down at the White House. In fact, one of the problems is, I can't name one person at the White House who has ever created a private sector job. And, you know, let's face it, they're good at creating public sector jobs, but they're not very good at creating pr private sector jobs. And the real answer to our debt problems is to work our way out of them and to, instead of talking about shared sacrifice, let's talk about shared prosperity by allowing the, allowing the uh, engine of this economy, the small business uh, community, to really pull us out. And even so, uh, we haven't even talked about the fact that the deficit this year, just in one year, is $1.6 trillion, $1.5, $1.6 trillion. And I might add that we're going to have at least probably close to a trillion dollars deficit every year under the President's own actuarial program every year up through 2020. You can imagine how we're going to continue to increase the debt without doing anything about it. And frankly, that's if his actuaries are right, and they're usually always wrong on the low side. And that includes actuaries of both sides, to be honest with you. The expenses have always been more. And I think uh, what's important here is, is that we, uh, we get real about working together and coming up with a way of resolving these tremendous debt problems. The future of our young, young people in this country depend on that, and I just don't want to let them down. I want to thank my colleague for his colloquy with me, and I appreciate it very much. With that, uh, suggest the absence of the, I, I yield the floor.